Let's see. By the way. Great, we are recording. Please keep your camera off if you don't want to be in the recording. Great, so uh, we'll continue with topics from last time, but starting from scratch, so we won't rely on any particular knowledge from yesterday. So uh, let me say once again, please interrupt uh, whenever you'd like with questions. That's the whole purpose of doing things like this live. Otherwise, you might as well be watching the recording. If you are watching the recording, hi, sorry you can't ask questions. So uh, let's uh, look at the simplest possible case. In particular, let's look at binary error correcting codes. So we're living in just a discrete universe. The entire world that we'll be dealing with just consists of binary vectors of length n. And here, this is much less deep in some ways than some of the infinite continuous spaces. On the other hand, all of the same ideas occur and you can think of this as sort of a test case. Anything you can't do in this setting, you probably can't do in more sophisticated settings. So how does this work? Well, the natural distance to put on this is the Hamming distance. In other words, if you want to know the Hamming distance between two binary vectors, x and y, just count up how many coordinates they differ in. And we'll also use the term weight to refer to the Hamming distance to the zero vector. In other words, the number of ones among our coordinates. So this is a really important setting in practice because it's the setting for binary error correcting codes. If we're sort of storing or transmitting binary data, we may want to have code words that we keep far apart from each other in order to make sure that even if they get slightly corrupted, they can't be confused with each other. So that naturally fits in a discrete setting like this. Incidentally, information theory deals with both continuous and discrete settings. You have some discrete settings where you're dealing with data that's already binary. You may also be interested in continuous settings because, for example, if you're sending a Wi-Fi signal, the signal itself is not intrinsically binary. On the other hand, uh, the simplest one is just binary error correcting codes like this. So the key thing we'll be trying to understand is what symmetries tell us about these things. So what is the isometry group? The isometry group is not hard to figure out. It consists of just two things. First of all, Z mod 2 acts in each coordinate by translation. And secondly, you can permute the coordinates however you like. And these fit together into a semi-direct product. And these, it's very simple to show both of these give isometries. And showing that these are all the isometries is not too hard. I'll leave it as something for you to think about. It takes an argument, but it's a short argument. So this group, it acts transitively on the binary Hamming space. So you can get from any vector to any other vector uh, using, in fact, just translations. And the importance of the permutation part here is it not only acts transitively, this is a two-point homogeneous space. In other words, for each distance i, g acts transitively on pairs of points at distance i. In other words, distance is the only invariant for a pair of points. If you want to know whether one pair can be transformed into another one, the only question is, are they at the same Hamming distance? And this really relies on the full isometry group, not just translations. So a key numerical invariant of codes is going to be the distance distribution, counting up how many times each pairwise distance occurs. So given a code, in other words, a subset of 0, 1 to the n, we're going to define the distance distribution ai to be the number of pairs of points at distance i we're going to normalize by the size of the code because that's convenient for lots of purposes. 
So one way of thinking about this is in coding theory terms, it gives you the weight enumerator of the code. Don't worry about it if you're not familiar with this. In physics terms, it gives you the pair correlation function, telling you how often each pairwise distance occurs. So one of the key questions that we'll be interested in is how can you characterize which vectors occur as distance distributions of actual codes? We don't know a complete solution of this problem. It's probably not really solvable. There probably isn't a better characterization than just, well, it's the ones that come from codes. But we'd like to find as much information as we can about which vectors can and can't occur. So why are we interested in pairwise distance distributions? It turns out it tells us lots of important structural information. For one thing, it tells us the minimal distance. The minimal distance D between two code words is determined by that's uh, the largest point at which all of the A's up to there vanish. So if you know which pairwise distances vanish, it tells you how good a code it is as judged by minimal distance between code words. It also determines energy under a pair potential. If we have some potential function f, and we want to determine a sort of energy of the code by summing up f over all of the, dis of the pairwise distances between distinct points, that's the same as weighting f by the ai's and summing, just because ai counts up how many times each distance occurs. So sort of energy or other interacting particle systems with pairwise interactions are determined by the distance distribution. And it also turns out it determines certain sorts of combinatorial design properties that we're not going to talk about today, but that are really important in the theory also. So here, the distance distribution does not determine everything we care about, but it does determine a lot of really fundamental things in discrete geometry and coding theory. Any questions about anything so far? Okay, so let me say a little bit more about energy. So we can define the energy with respect to a potential function f, let's call it e sub f of c, to be what you get when you sum f over all the distances between distinct points. I'm going to count both orders, x, y, and y, x. That annoys physicists, but whatever. And we're going to normalize by dividing by the sum of the code because it's convenient. The normalization doesn't really matter. So here, one way of thinking about this is in terms of discrete models of physics, that here you could imagine that the points in your code are particles, and the particles are interacting via some sort of potential function. So for example, maybe they repel each other. In other words, the potential function gets bigger the closer the particles are. And then here, a question you could ask is, what's the ground state of this system? In other words, if you know the potential function f and you know the number of particles, in other words, the size of the code, how can you arrange them to minimize the energy? And you can ask physics questions like, do they crystallize into some sort of really beautiful symmetrical state or do they do something sort of complicated and ad hoc? So one way of thinking about this is as a discrete model of physics. It also comes up really naturally in information theory. So for example, here's a concrete application. Let's imagine we're going to transmit our code over what's called the binary symmetric channel. In other words, we're gonna send a code word to somebody. However, in the process of transmitting it, each bit may be flipped. And we'll look at the simplest sort of model. Each bit is flipped independently with probability P. So P is probably pretty small, but it's not zero. Each bit we send, there's some independent chance that it comes out wrong. Here, symmetric just means zero to one and one to zero are equally likely. So if we have a code C, and if we send, let's say, a randomly selected element of C over our channel, you can ask, what's the chance of an undetected error? Here, the point is that 
if your code word gets corrupted, if what gets received is not actually a code word, then you know there was an error. You might have to think about what the most likely original code word was, but if you get something that's not even in the code, then you've detected the error. On the other hand, if you get a different code word, then you get an undetected error. Nobody knows whether you meant to send that code word or whether you tried to send a different code word and it got corrupted. So we'd really like to know what's the probability of having an undetected error when we transmit over this channel. So if you send X and if you have some Y at distance I from it, what's the probability that you receive Y? Well, that probability is P to the I, because there are I coordinates that have to get corrupted, times one minus P to the N minus I, because all the other coordinates have to stay the same. So we can factor out the I related stuff and write this probability as p over one minus p to the ith power times a constant. In other words, we've got a, a probability that's exponentially decreasing as a function of i. So if we send on this channel, then the energy with respect to this particular exponential potential function f is exactly the probability of undetected error. We're averaging overall sent code words X and overall possible received words Y of the probability that X got transformed into Y. So from this perspective, choosing your code to minimize the probability of undetected error is exactly the same as looking for a ground state under an exponentially decreasing potential function. So from this perspective, even though it sounds like a sort of weird discrete model of physics, this is actually something people really care about in information theory, namely avoiding undetected errors. Questions about anything so far? Okay, so a fundamental question here is, what does the answer depend on? So we're trying to minimize the energy of our code among all codes with the same number of code words, the same number of points in the code, and where we have a particular potential function f in mind. For example, this exponentially decreasing potential. And you could ask things like, does the answer depend on the bit flip probability p from the channel? And sometimes the answer is yes. If you really want to optimize your code, sometimes which code to choose depends on the particular channel you're going to apply it in. So that's exactly what you expect. A different problem usually has a different answer. But it's not always true. There are some famous codes like Hamming and Golay codes. Don't worry if you don't know what they are, we'll just treat them as a black box. Some famous codes minimize the energy for all reasonable potential functions. For example, all of these exponential functions. In fact, even more, we'll make it more precise later. So there are some famous codes which have the property that they are optimal no matter which channel you try to apply them to within at least a certain family. And from that perspective, these codes are extremely robust. And part of the reason that they're so famous is they're not even specifically optimized for one particular channel. They work robustly over a wide range of them. So a key question we'd like to understand is when does this sort of robustness occur? And more generally, when should we expect to get order versus disorder? So in some cases, like Hamming and Golay codes, you have beautiful, highly structured symmetrical codes, kind of like crystals, which in fact solve a wide range of optimization problems simultaneously. And in some other cases, the optimal codes seem to be disordered or pseudo-random, and instead you get something complicated and ad hoc in each problem, and there doesn't seem to be any sort of nice or universal solution. Instead, you just do whatever weird thing happens to be optimal. 
So a sort of big question we'd like to understand is what is the distinction here? Can we understand when you should get beautiful symmetrical solutions and when you should get something disordered or pseudo-random? And probably we're never going to understand this completely. I'm not proposing this as a problem where I think that, you know, in 10 years, somebody's going to prove a theorem that completely solves this. But it's part of the motivation here. The more we learn, the better we understand the distinction between these. So here, the way this comes up in coding theory is if you look asymptotically at very long uh, code words, the best codes that are known are typically obtained by probabilistic constructions. So they're not just pseudo-random, they're in fact randomly chosen, and they don't have any particularly nice uh, symmetry group acting on them. So by contrast, a lot of small codes are constructed algebraically and uh, involve beautiful symmetries. And it's not really clear where the dividing line between these sorts of constructions is. We can also view this as a discrete model of physics and think about this as material science. And the question is, how do we understand which sorts of things crystallize nicely and which sorts of things turn into a lump of dirt or something? And this is something that I always imagined crystallographers understood. I thought to myself, well, you know, humanity has been studying crystals for centuries. Surely we must understand this by now. It turns out crystallographers have a really good sort of descriptive theory of crystals, that they can tell you an awful lot about what sort of crystal forms are possible, what sort of uh, materials attain different crystal structures. However, understanding why things crystallize at a fundamental mathematical level is still really hard. So you can think of these sorts of coding theory problems as a sort of a toy version of that. A lot of the same principles come up, but on the other hand, in a discrete finite world, basically think of it as a test case. If you can't understand zero, one to the n, you're never going to be able to understand Rm. Questions about anything so far? Okay, so the fundamental thing we're going to do today is build the Del Sardin equalities. So what these are going to be is they're going to be certain linear constraints on the distance distribution A0 up to AM. So some constraints are obvious. So for example, A0 is one, AI is greater than or equal to zero, and the sum of all the AIs is the size of the code. So these follow directly from the definition. Here, you get the size of the code rather than size of the code squared because of the way we normalized. So there are certain inequalities that are very simple. And what Del, Del Sart discovered in the 1970s is there are other inequalities that are equally important but much less obvious. So you can do them in a lot of ways. You can do them in very elementary ways. You can build up the algebraic theory in half a dozen different ways. You can do all sorts of things. We'll put it in the context of representations of G because I like this way of thinking about it and feel like it generalizes fairly productively. But what we'll do today is really not the only way of understanding this. So the question is, how do we understand sort of structure of pairwise distances? Incidentally, before I go on, let me say one other thing. There's at least one other really simple property, namely the AIs are all rational numbers whose denominator divides the size of the code. So that's something we left out of the list here. The reason we left this out is partly because uh, we don't know how to take advantage of that via optimization. But certainly this isn't a comprehensive list of all uh, possibilities. So there's a question in the chat, isn't the sum of these the size of the code choose two? So here 
where did I put the definition? Oh yeah, so here we're, we're counting ordered pairs, uh, not necessarily distinct, all possible ordered pairs. So basically the number of ordered pairs is the size of the code squared, and then we're normalizing by a factor of the size of the code. The other, the size of the code choose two interpretation would have come up if we'd been doing unordered distinct pairs, but we're looking at ordered pairs. Other questions? Okay, so let's think about functions on our space. So let's look at what I'll call L2. Don't worry about square integrability. The thing is that we're in a discrete finite world. So this is just the space of all complex valued functions on X. So let's look at the space of functions on X. And let's ask, how does the isometry group G act on the space of functions? So remember that the isometry group of X acts not just on the points of X, but also on functions on X. So L2 of X is a representation of G. And what we're interested in is how do we break up this representation under the action of G? So let's start with the simplest part of the isometry group, namely the group Z mod 2Z to the N of translations. And so there, this is a nice abelian group and everything's very simple. We can break up functions on X into linear combinations of characters of this group. In other words, we have a bunch of functions chi sub Y where chi sub y of x is minus one to just the dot product of x and y. And each of these is a multiplicative character of z mod 2z to the n, and they span all the functions on 0, 1 to the n. So what happens here is L2 breaks up into, uh, into linear combinations of characters, and each character is preserved by the action of z mod 2z. If you translate its input, it just gets multiplied by some constant. So as far as z mod 2z to the n goes, everything breaks up into one-dimensional irreducible representations. So that's nice. This is basically the theory of the discrete Fourier transform on z mod 2z to the n. So here, for representations of z mod 2z to the n, everything broke up very nicely. What does the symmetric group do? Well, the symmetric group, if you act on things, it just permutes the coordinates of our points. In other words, it permutes the coordinates of the vectors indexing the characters. So basically, if you break things up under the full isometry group, it just sort of glues together a bunch of characters, where now all characters of the same weight get glued together, and we get a decomposition of L2 of X into representations, let's call them VJ, indexed by a weight from zero to M, where each one is just the span of all of the weight J characters. So we've decomposed L2 of X into representations under the full isometry group. Incidentally, it's a little bit tricky knowing how much detail to go into in the representation theory. This is the sort of stuff where if you're used to representation theory, what I've described is fairly straightforward. If you're not used to representation theory, it may look fairly arcane Basically, if you're not used to this, it's worth sitting down with scratch paper, messing around with it, convincing yourself this is really true, because it's a perspective that's really valuable to have, to get comfortable enough with how these sorts of groups act, that these sorts of representations feel very natural and friendly. In any case, the basic fact though is simple, that Z mod 2Z to the N breaks it up into characters and then the symmetric group just sort of mixes together characters that are related by permutations. 
So here we've got a representation. This is in fact an irreducible representation of G. And let's normalize the inner product so that the character is chi sub y or orthonormal. It's just a matter of what multiplicative constant we use. So here, a key thing is within this representation, there's a unique vector that's invariant under SN up to scaling. Namely, if you take a sum of all of the characters of weight J, then that's invariant under SN just because all of the index vectors Y of weight J is just preserved by permuting the coordinates. Permutation of coordinates preserves weights of vectors. And in fact, this is the only way to get an SN invariant vector. So why should we care? What's the point of sort of focusing on vectors invariant under SN? The general principle here is if you have a representation of a group G, and if you have a vector in this representation that's fixed by a subgroup H, then that gives you a map from G mod H into the representation that just sends an element G to G acting on V. And here what happens is uh, the importance of having an H fixed vector is we want this to be well defined. In other words, if we multiply on the right by any element of H, we want to get the same answer. And that's exactly the same as saying the vector should be fixed by H. And here, the important thing is that this map is equivariant. In other words, it preserves the action of G. So in VJ, we've got an SN fixed vector. And that gives us a map from the quotient space of group modulo permutations, in other words, the space 0, 1 to the n, into the representation vj. Let's call it phi j. And what it does is it just maps any point x in here into what happens when you act by translations on the fixed vector. So remember, the fixed vector was chi sub y. And if we act by translation by x on chi sub y, it multiplies it by plus or minus 1, namely this factor. So we know exactly what x gets mapped to. So what this is telling us is we've got a way of embedding a binary vector into our representation vj, namely by sending it to a linear combination of characters where the character, where the where the combination that we give is exactly chi sub y of x. Any questions about anything so far? OK, so now that we have this embedding, life is good. We're done with all of the technicalities at this point. Now, what do we do? So there's one inequality that's the most important inequality in all of math, namely the squared length of any vector is greater than or equal to zero. And sort of vast chunks of the theory of inequalities consist of basically unfolding the consequences of squares being greater than or equal to zero. So in our case, if we apply this to the embedding of our code, what do we get? If we expand this using bilinearity, we get a sum over all points x and y in the code of the inner product of phi j of x and phi j of y. So what I claim is this inner product depends only on, first of all, the representation j, but also the distance from x to y by g invariance. Everything in our construction so far is fully invariant under the group G. So this particular inner product can only depend on the G orbit of the pair. But remember that our space is two-point homogeneous. In other words, the G orbit of the pair XY depends only on the Hamming distance. So whatever this is, it can depend only on the Hamming distance of X and Y. So let's call it case of j with parameter n. 
So what this tells us is the sum over x and y in the code of k sub j of the distance is greater than or equal to zero. In other words, if we write this in terms of the distance distribution, it tells us the sum of the ai's weighted by some k function k sub j of i are greater than or equal to zero. And these are the Delsard inequalities. These inequalities are giving us certain linear inequalities on the distance distribution ai with certain funky coefficients k sub j of i. And these inequalities, unlike the earlier ones, are really not obvious. They're not complicated. The underlying reason is actually pretty simple, but they're not at all the first thing that you would think of sort of looking at this problem. Questions about anything so far? Ah, uh, is there a geometric interpretation of this? Yes, there is. Uh, so let's think about this. So what is kj? So the answer is it's something called a Kravchuk polynomial. Sadly, nobody knows how to spell Kravchuk. Uh, the thing is, it's been transliterated in a lot of different ways. What I've written is maybe the most common spelling, but not the only one. So let's think about this. So there are a couple of things that we can do. One is we can write down an explicit formula, k sub j of i, is uh, we can write it as a sum of minus one to the dot product x, y over all uh, weight i vectors. So this is something which if you take the uh, definition we gave before and just expand things out, you get this. So this gives an explicit formula. And in fact, by counting up vectors based on overlap, you can also write it down directly in terms of binomial coefficients. So one answer as to what this is, is this gives you uh, a direct sort of explicit formula for it. It doesn't answer the question from the chat about a geometric interpretation directly, but you can interpret this that way too. I don't want to get it into, into it in too much detail, but one interpretation of this is in terms of discrete Fourier transforms, that basically k sub j is going to be a radial function on our space whose discrete Fourier transform is the characteristic function of a sphere. So one way of thinking about this geometrically is this is going to be a discrete Fourier transform of the characteristic function of a sphere. We won't need that, but it was a very nice way of thinking about it. And there are lots of other interpretations. You can interpret this in terms of reproducing kernels for these Hilbert spaces, all sorts of things. The key thing that we'll need is, though this is something very concrete, we have an explicit combinatorial formula for it. And this formula gives a polynomial in I of degree J. So these are literally polynomials. And furthermore, there are orthogonal polynomials in a discrete space. Remember that the characters chi sub y are orthogonal. And so these linear combinations are going to inherit orthogonality from that. If you work out exactly what it says, it's going to say that k sub j and k sub k are orthogonal on the integers from 0 to n where we give the integer i a weight of n choose i. So basically, these are very nice polynomials. They're beautiful orthogonal polynomials. They've got maybe not the world's nicest explicit formula, but in the overall scheme of things, it's not too complicated. So these are something which, if you sit down with a computer algebra system, you can very easily compute just by making it compute them according to this formula. So what does this give us? So, so far, what do we know about the distance distribution? We know the obvious inequalities we had to start with. And we also know the Delsard inequalities, the non-obvious ones. And the linear programming bound here is amounts to optimization subject to these inequalities.
So basically it amounts to everything we can learn if the only thing we know about the vector A is that it satisfies these linear inequalities. Some of them are equalities, but equalities are a special case of inequalities. So for example, we get a bound on energy. If you wanna know how small can energy be, you can ask, well, how do you minimize it subject to the Delsard inequalities? And that will give you a lower bound for the energy of codes. Why a lower bound? The point is we're only taking into account partial information. We don't know exactly which vectors A correspond to codes. All we know is a superset of that, namely things satisfying the Delsard inequalities. But we can still ask, what's the lowest energy you can get subject to the Delsard inequalities? And then codes can't do any better than that. They might do worse because they might not achieve the full minimum. Similarly, if we want to ask how big can a code be given its minimal distance, then we can say, well, what if we impose the Delsard inequalities and we set A1 equals A2 up to AD minus 1 equals 0? And then what if we try to maximize the size of the code? In other words, the sum of all of the AIs. So in each case, this is a linear program. In other words, we're trying to optimize a linear function subject to linear inequalities. So this is something that we can just ask a computer to do, and it can solve the problem for us. So in any fixed case, if somebody gives you particular parameters, you can just solve this numerically. In fact, you can solve it exactly using rational arithmetic and you can get the exact answer. What's really frustrating is we don't have a general solution. Nobody knows a sort of nice abstract way to write down the best solution to this linear program in general. You can solve it algorithmically in fixed cases and you can give generally suboptimal bounds in arbitrary cases, but the general problem remains unsolved. And so we really don't know the answer to the question of what do the Delsard inequalities tell us. We know they tell us some valuable things, but exactly how much they tell us remains to be seen. So incidentally, a sort of meta question here is when do LP bounds apply? So for example, we've seen that they apply to things like energy under a pair potential, or size of a code given minimal distance. And more generally, the case when you should expect to get information out is they apply when the pairwise distance distribution determines everything. So for example, packing and error correcting code problems are determined by the pairwise distance distribution. In other words, you want to know for all pairs of points, how close do they get from each other? So that is a good case for this. By contrast, covering problems where you don't just ask about distances between code words, but you ask how close do code words come to arbitrary other points, that can't be phrased directly in terms of the distance distribution. And so we don't get LP bounds for covering. And incidentally, the STP bounds along the lines that Dobbin's talking about in his course they incorporate not just pairwise constraints, but also higher order correlations between more than two points. And so they get correspondingly more powerful. So a fundamental question you can ask here is when are the linear programming bounds sharp? When should this give the exact answer? And the answer is, well, usually it doesn't. If you solve this numerically, it generally gives a pretty good bound for the truth, but it doesn't seem to match the truth. However, there are certain important cases like Hamming and Golay codes where linear programming bounds give the exact answer. And a fundamental question is, why should it give the exact answer for these particularly beautiful codes, but not others? And people have proved a lot of stuff related to this. Levenstein has given a beautiful partial answer but we still don't have a sort of conclusive answer to this. So one thing I really love is
the fact that these optimize lots of different problems. So there's a beautiful class of potential functions called completely monotonic potential functions. I'll go through this pretty quickly since we're running out of time, but basically think of this as the natural continuation of saying your potential function should be decreasing. In other words, it repels the points. It should be convex. In other words, it repels stronger and stronger as the points get closer. And then there's the etc, which is actually pretty natural, but uh, let's just say completely monotonic means decreasing convex, et cetera, with higher order differences or derivatives. So we'll say code is universally optimal if it minimizes energy for every completely monotonic potential function. So it turns out that every known case where LP bounds are sharp are universally optimal. So I should say, with the exception of a few degenerate cases, every known interesting case, let me not try to make it precise at the moment. So this is an analog of what Abhinav, Steve, Danilo, Marina, and I proved for E8 and the leech lattice with universal optimality there. This is sort of a discrete version of this. And a fundamental question you could ask is, why should this happen? So years ago, I thought I knew why it should happen. So we can say, let's define a quasi-code to be a vector satisfying the Delsard inequalities. So in other words, a quasi-code is a sort of dual solution to the LP bound. In other words, it is what the best thing, what the best code could be except there might not be any actual code that attains this because codes might not achieve the full LP bound. So you could ask, is there always a universally optimal quasi-code for all block lengths little n and number of points capital N? So if that were true, then that would be saying the LP bounds always want universal optimality. And the only question is whether actual codes achieve this. So this is in fact true for every block length up to 11 and every number of points, but it fails if you have between 24 and 40 points in a quasi code in 12 dimensions. Yufei Zhao and I found this counterexample, and I find this utterly perplexing. The thing is, up to block length 11, it really looks like LP bounds want universal optimality, but they don't always. And I really don't understand why this happens. So I think a big question here that deserves further research is, why does universal optimality occur so often? Are there any sharp cases in which it doesn't occur? What's a good sort of conceptual explanation of why it feels like the theory wants universal optimality so often, but not always? And in particular, the Hamming and Golay codes are analogous to E8 and the Leech lattice in Euclidean space. So there, Vyazovska has this beautiful theory uh, of using modular forms and a certain integral transform. And you can ask, does her approach have a discrete analog here? I think the answer should be yes. I think that modular forms are going to correspond to certain invariant polynomials for finite matrix groups and that everything should work beautifully, but I haven't actually done it. And if anybody works this out, I'd be really curious to see it because I feel like it would be very interesting to understand how basically Vyazovska's theory applies in a finite discrete world. Another sort of question here conceptually is, how does this compare more generally with Euclidean space? So everything is extremely closely analogous to Euclidean space with one fundamental exception, namely a theorem Yufei Zhao and I proved in zero one to the n, which as far as we can tell, doesn't have a Euclidean analog. So what we said is 
if you have any code in 0, 1 to the n that's LP universally optimal, in other words, it's universally optimal and LP bounds prove it, then it turns out the code remains universally optimal if any one code word is removed from it. So notice we didn't say it remains LP universally optimal. You can't iterate this because you lose the LP optimality as you do it generally. But it says anything that's LP universally optimal, like for example, Hamming or Golay code, it stays universally optimal if you remove a single code word. And I find this very strange. I don't understand what the Euclidean analog of this would be. I would really love to understand the extent to which this is either fundamentally a discrete fact, and if so, what it means, or the extent to which it has some Euclidean analog. But in any case, the point here is I view basically 0, 1 to the n as sort of a test case for Euclidean, the Euclidean setting where it's beautiful and finite in any specific case can just be done computationally. And I think there are lots of interesting problems regarding both the question of how far can the analogy be pushed in terms of carrying over things in one direction or another, either carrying over this theorem to Euclidean space or conversely carrying over Vyazovska's approach to a discrete space. So in any case, I've listed a few exercises that you might enjoy thinking about. And I've also listed some further reading. I've listed a couple of papers that deal with a very different algebraic approach, namely association schemes, which is something that's very beautiful. It's less familiar in pure math than some of the representation theory. So I haven't focused on it today, but it gives a really nice way of understanding how this works and also a reference to the paper with Yufe about uh, sort of discrete models of physics. So uh, any questions? Well, thanks very much, Henry. Uh, let's uh, stop the recording and uh,